You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. How are you today? Uh, I hope you're, I thank you for choosing our podcast, the little old podcast to uh, start your week, or maybe it's the end of your week and you're listening to it. I really don't know, but I, I really appreciate you taking the time out to listen. And I know some people are here from Misha Collins, and I hope that after the episode, you're like, you know, I dug that. I want to stick around. I'm going to subscribe to this guy's podcast. Give it a chance. Because I think a lot of times people come, Ryan, for the guest. Yeah, I would say that's true for a lot of podcasts. Yeah, they, they, I'm, I'm here to listen to Misha Collins, not mm-hmm. Michael Rosenbaum, which is fair. But maybe he's a gateway drug for a lot of people to get into the podcast. There you go. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> I just did an audition and I'm still talking like that. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, if you want to follow us, uh, you can follow us on Twitter at Inside of You, at Inside of you Pod, and Instagram and Facebook at, at Inside of You Podcast. Mm-hmm. I appreciate it. You can write reviews on Spotify, Apple, wherever. Watch the uh, episode on YouTube if you like. You can watch the entire episode. We also have clips and things like that. So I appreciate you doing that and appreciate you uh, supporting the podcast today. Um, Ryan, did you have a good week? Yeah. Yeah. You're uh, busy this week. I'm busy this week. You are busy. I got a lot of things going on this yeah. week. In uh, fact, I'm supposed to interview Jared Padalecki and I got to figure out who's going to be my engineer for that. I know. I cannot be here for it. <laughs> cannot be here for it. So hopefully we'll get Jason, my sweet editor, to uh, to be part of that if he has time. You know, because Jared's a busy guy. If we don't get him, we may not get him again for a while. Hopefully he doesn't flake. Well, he's not really a flake. Mm. I mean, he hasn't flaked on me before. Uh, what else? Uh, if you want to go to the Inside of You online store, you can get great merch like autographed lunch bo- small the lunch boxes from me and Tom, and we autograph those, or just an autographed lunch box from me. Autograph scripts, sign pictures, mugs, tumblers, shirts, so many, so much great stuff on the uh, Inside of You online store. And also, if you want to go to Sunspin.com, that's my band. It's called Sunspin. Sunspin.com. You can get band merch. You can book me for a Zoom. If you want to zoom with me, I'm also on the cameo. And uh, yes, uh, that's that's really about it. Misha Collins is the guest today. Uh, we talk about a lot of stuff. We, uh, you know, he's just a, he's a really good guy. Uh, it was nice having him here in the studio. Was wasn't it nice? It's just so much nicer when I had Jensen here. I had <laughs> Misha, um, and he's got a good he's got a good microphone voice too. He does. He's got a really infectious it's rich it's rich it's deep it's gravelly it is it's accented <laughs> and people love this guy yeah people love misha i think he's got a heart of gold too and uh you know let's just do it let's uh i'm reminding you now to after the podcast is over uh please subscribe and do all that stuff if you're here for misha also join patreon patreon.com slash inside of you you could join patron, uh, become a patron, and support the podcast in other ways. The podcast needs your help. So if you want to become a patron, I always uh, message you after you become a patron. I send a message saying thank you. So go to patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash inside of you. And without further ado, let's get inside of Misha Collins. It's my point of view. You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum was not recorded in front of a live studio audience. You know, Misha, I always feel like the guest is going to get up and walk out. I, I, I might get up and walk out at any moment. Please don't. Um, I always feel nice it. To, it's nice to see you. It's nice in to person. see you. It is nice to see you in person. The as last well. time we did this, it was uh, a Zoom. It was a virtual experience. Yeah, and don't you feel like those are kind of not, they're impersonal? They're, or they're just you feel like there's not as much of a connection. Yeah, it's nice. You get to shield yourself from actually being known by the other person. In this industry, it's always like, what are you doing? And people are like, oh, I'm doing this. And I got this script going on. And I got, you know, and I got this one show. And I'm doing a food show. And I'm doing, you've got all these things going on. But there's something really brave and cool to just go, I don't have shit going on right now. I'm taking care of me. I'm taking care of myself. I want to get, I want to feel good. Because I read somewhere that, you know, at, at, towards the end of Supernatural, like you hit a fucking wall. Like, you know, I, to quote you, it was something like you were deeply fried. I don't know if you said that. But uh, and the net effect of that was that you were really you weren't really loving anything, dreading everything. Is this true? I don't know about dreading everything, but I I was I mean, I think the colloquial <laughs> term is burnt out. I, um, it was we 
uh, we were doing a breakneck schedule of fan conventions and shooting on Supernatural. And I was living in Washington State and driving across the border. So my commute was, you know, it, some some mornings it was an hour and a half in the car Jesus. just to get to work. And and then I'd be driving home at three o'clock in the morning, you know, at, and crossing the border. And I um, I was exhausted. I was also, you know, running a nonprofit and or not running a nonprofit, but I was, you know, board president of a nonprofit that I had started. And I was, you know, uh doing these scavenger hunts and the cons and the conventions and, uh, and other, you know, businesses and working on writing projects. I had so much work that I was doing that I, uh, that it became difficult to enjoy any of the work. If I'm being honest, like I didn't have, I, I wasn't well resourced enough to be happy at that point. And, um, and it just wasn't sustainable. But at the same time, like I, I definitely was running on the fumes to an extent. Um, and the cortisol kept me going. And I think that that even has an addictive property. At least it does for me. Like working, you know, you know they call it workaholism for a reason. Are like you a workaholic? It, I can be. I can get into a, a pattern of if I don't know what to do with myself, I'll work. And that can be a treadmill that's hard to get off of for me right. at times. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's tough. I remember doing Smallville and I, I, rem- I remember just being absolutely exhausted by episode like 19 of 23 or 20, whatever episodes we did. And you, we, we drove ourselves for quite some time. And, um, and as did you, you guys yeah. drove yourselves. But I remember one location was over an hour away. It was always raining. And Jared and Jensen never drove themselves. They, they never o- did. They, they never did. Had drivers. Could you have had a driver? Or no, they just weren't going to give you a driver? They weren't going to give me a driver. After 12 years, after eight years, after five years? No, no, no. no. You know, it, it's funny. As soon as you become Those a regular. Son of a bitch. They should have stuck up for you. <laughs> as soon as you become a regular, you lose your driver. It's kind of ironic, right? right? Guest stars get drivers, but. But it was a good thing you would take that exchange. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I mean, but I remember driving and with one eye closed. And I was just really depressed. I was just down. And not to knock Canada. I love Canada. I love Canadians. I love Vancouver. But Vancouver rains a lot and it gets depressing. And I remember there's one time I'm just listening to this depressing song. And I felt like Chris Farley. Like mm-hmm. I was like, I want to drive the goddamn car off the road. <laughs> I just felt like I really was. I had to pull over and just like get my bearings because I was really like just physically and emotionally exhausted. I was done. And I was there two hours before everybody shaved in the head. I, w- I just remember that one time going, holy shit, dude, you've lost your mind. You're gonna be one of those actors that they write about. Not for very long, just for like maybe the day. That's the thing on Twitter. Someone dies, unfortunately. And it's just like, oh my God. And then the next day you're, you know, what the fuck is that? Right. Where was I going with this? <laughs> but you were burnt out. You no, were burnt. No, I mean, I think that that is, you know, it's it's funny. I mean, it's not funny. Um, <laughs> it is, it is a, you know, everyone says, you know, it's it's not as glamorous as you think or whatever. There are so many aspects of of the job working as an actor that are amazing. Amazing. And it's and very there, lucky. And there's so many like pinch me moments, right? Where you can't believe that the good fortune that you have. And you and you also have to remind yourself to be grateful for the good fortune that you have. But it, uh, but the fact of the matter is you also are quite often working until three o'clock in the morning or four o'clock in the morning and then driving yourself home. Or what we would do often is work until three o'clock in the morning on a Friday and drive to the airport and just wait for the 6 a.m. flight to get to the East Coast to do a convention. And it was oh like you're not God. your body doesn't. Your body can't. And the older you get, you can do it when you're in your 20s, early 30s. You start to hit your 40s, late 40s, like me. I'm almost 50. It's amazing how those things, just your body goes, no way. No, thank you. (laughs) No, I'm not, I'm not doing that. You're not doing that. You're not getting on another plane. And you have to listen to your body because with me, I just know that if I'm exhausted or if emotionally, I mean, that's when the anxiety kicks in. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing worse than having anxiety on ta- attack on set. Have you ever had an anxiety attack on set? No. What's that like? <laughs> Fuck. Have you, you just, have you had, had it? Have you oh, had yeah, it like I, where where it it debilitated I, you? Or I, debilitating. I was I was the lead on this series, short lived show, last couple seasons called Impastor, and I remember being. 
I remember doing a lot of push-ups right before the take and I had to run across and talk to the, uh, this other pastor in the scene and I ran across and I'm looking at him and my whole body started to get kind of numb and my heartbeat was kind of racing and I go, I'm, I'm going to have a heart attack. I didn't say that. I go, and I was just, I think I knew my line so well that nobody knew, but I was freaking the fuck out as I'm giving these lines. Mm -hmm. And it happened to be lunch after that take. And I thought, oh my God, what's going on? You know, hey, Troy, my assistant, was, get get a doctor. And Dr. Lim came on site, you know, Dr. Oh yeah, <laughs> I love Dr. Lim. <laughs> Dr. Lim, oh, he was the best. And he came on and goes, um, Michael, um, he ch I'm checking everything. Everything seems to be, have you ever had a, an anxiety attack? That's a great Dr. Lim impersonation. <laughs> I, does does Dr. Lim know that you impersonate him? <laughs> I didn't even mean to. I just tried. <laughs> <laughs> he speaks so quietly and so comforting. Mm -hmm. Actually, he is the the nice antidote man. to a panic attack. Just that voice is very <laughs> yeah. soothing. So, uh, you know, it could be, um, uh, you could be having a, but hearing that was terrifying. Because we had about three episodes left, and I go, this is going to happen again. You're always anticipating it, and it did happen again in this final sequence. And I remember I was freaking out. I didn't want to tell anybody. It's embarrassing. Oh, my God. I can't be doing this. I'm the lead actor. I can't have a panic attack. They're going to, you know. So I just go, hey, guys, I got to go to the bathroom. I My stomach's bothering me. Can I, I got to really take a shit right now. I think I told this story. And. And the director's like, hey, can we just do one more take? And I go, I go, uh, I really need to go. And so I raced to my trailer and I went in there and I'm like a drug addict looking for my Xanax, looking for the pills. Where, where are they? Just throwing everything away. My Troy walks in, the assistant, and is like, you okay? I'm like, no, I'm having a panic attack. I'm, I'm numb. I, I'm tingling in my arms and my legs. I'm just like, it was just sheer exhaustion. It was a combination of not sleeping, stress, and whatever. I, I don't know. Being overwhelmed. And it just... It is a terrifying thing, and I, I refuse to tell anybody. I think now I'm in a place where I would say, hey, guys, I'm having a little anxiety attack right now. I just want the crew to know. I'm hopefully going to get through it, but I'd uh, like everybody to know. So it's not, uh, what the fuck's wrong with Rosenbaum? Mm -hmm. This is what's wrong with him. <laughs> I'm having an anxiety attack and uh, you know, trying to erase the stigma and trying to show you that I'm a human being, and I've just, uh, I'm overwhelmed right now. So if ever, of course, that would freak everybody out. Right, more, everybody right? would be like, "Oh my god, he's lost his <laughs> big mind." A, so what do you do? <laughs> what would you do in that situation? I, I, I mean, I think I've, I've dealt with anxiety on set. I think I've dealt with anxiety in auditions and like test situations that mm -hmm. was pretty severe. Yep, um, and difficult to get through the work because of. Um, but I've had, I had panic attacks probably about for a little stretch about about twenty years ago. And it, it is almost impossible to describe because it is so overwhelming and it feels so physical. You feel um, like you're going to pass out. Well, I I thought I was like you. I thought I was having a heart attack. Yeah. I mean, it seems like something in your body is you. Something is radically wrong. Right. It's not just like I'm anxious. I'm nervous. Which, by the way, anxiety when it's when it's not a full blown panic attack can also be quite debilitating. But. Yeah. Uh, it's it feels visceral. It feels very physical. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, <laughs> um, you you calling out to the crew and letting <laughs> Is that them not know, a good idea? Let, letting them know that you need a moment reminds me of one of my early experiences <laughs> with one of the worst directors. I was working on this movie that uh, it was a, it was my first big role in an independent feature. This was almost twenty years ago. And the director was, he really didn't know what he was doing, but he thought that he was Scorsese. And <laughs> it was my oh, first no. day on set. And uh, and he, uh, we, and we did one take. And he comes up to me and he, he had this really kind of creepy way of of talking to actors, which is he would, he would whisper conspiratorially in your ear as if what he was saying was shameful. Jesus. And so he comes up to me and he says, ah, um, Misha, um, are you all right? You seem a little, eh. And I was like, what, what? You don't I, say I, that I, to I, an actor. Like after the first take on my first day on set. So I, now I'm thinking, oh God, why well, I've, I've come, like, I'm, they're going to fire me. Oh, this is horrible. Who is this guy? And, uh, 
And he says, and I say, yeah, I think I'm okay. And he's like, looks at me sort of side eye and like, are you sure? And I said, yeah. And he said, okay, okay. All right, everyone, we're going again. And I said, wait, wait, um, Larry, can you just, I'm sorry, can, can you give me one second? And he said, sure. And then he screams, everyone, quiet on the set. Misha needs a minute. <laughs> this is the worst director in the history like, of directing. It was this cavalcade of bad directing uh, and choices. And this probably made you freak out even more. Of course it did. Yes. So there I was in the middle of my first scene on the on having you know, a little bit of a panic day, attack. Having a panic attack that was quite uh, in, uh, due in large part to the director's bad directing. <laughs> <laughs> This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Everybody knows these guys. Everybody loves them. I love them. Ryan? That's great. Yeah? Yep. It's helping you. I'm getting a lot out of it. Amen. Mm -hmm. Look, folks, relationships take work, especially the most important one you can have in your life, and that is your relationship with yourself. A lot of us will drop anything to go help someone we care about. We'll go out of our way to treat other people well, but how often do we give ourselves the same treatment? It's true, we don't. We're not good to ourselves enough, and you got to be good to yourself, and you'll learn how to be good to yourself, but one of those things you could do is join uh, BetterHelp. This month, BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you that you matter just as much as everyone else does. And therapy is a great way to make sure you show up for yourself. Ryan, what would you say BetterHelp is doing for you? Uh, it is helping me to uh, learn about myself better, uh, how to treat myself better, uh, and, and just talking about things that are bothering me, however big or small. Yeah, because sometimes you think, oh, I have friends to talk to. I have... Mm -hmm. No, you, you can't be absolutely open with your thoughts and your demons and your thing just with friends or, you know, people think they take it. It's so easy, you know, like, oh, I, I don't need to worry about that. And it builds up and it builds up and it festers and we all implode at some point. <laughs> so we got to take care of ourselves and better help. Online therapy is there to help us. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Give it a try and see why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp online therapy. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and inside of you listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash inside. That's B E T T E R H E L P dot com slash inside. Thank you, BetterHelp. Couldn't do it without you. Inside of You is brought to you by Nutrafol. 80 million men, Ryan, and women in the U.S. experience thinning hair. Yes, it's still not openly talked about, which can make going through it feel scary, yeah. stressful, and, and, and that just adds to the problem, doesn't it? It does. But what if I were to tell you that, uh, this is normal. Hmm. Do you understand? This is that millions of Americans experience thinning hair, and it's more than common. It's it's normal for pe people to experience this in all in all ages. I've seen it with my friends. I've seen them in their twenties losing their hair. I've seen people in their forties onwards, and there are things you can do. Hmm. And Nutrafol is here to help. Uh, you know, thinning hair is not openly talked about, so going through it can feel lonely, frustrating. It's time to change the conversation and join the thousands of people standing up for their strands with Nutrafol. Nutrafol is the number one dermatologist recommended hair growth supplement clinically shown to improve your hair growth, thickness, and visible scalp coverage for men and women. You know that there are multiple causes of thinning hair? Nutrafol is the hair growth supplement that goes beyond genetics to target stress, hormones, nutrition, metabolism, aging, and lifestyle factors that may be impacting your hair. Thinning is different for men and women. Nutrafol has multiple unique formulas for men and women to provide exactly what they need based on their biology and age. And every formula is physician formulated using natural medical grade ingredients to, for reliable results without compromises. Nutrafol is a simple addition to your daily routine, just four pills a day, and you'll begin to experience thicker, stronger, faster growing hair in just three to six months. Visit Nutrafol.com and take their hair wellness quiz. It's easy. I could take it for God's sakes. 
you get a customized product recommendation that puts the power to grow thicker, stronger hair back into your hands. In clinical studies, 72% of men saw more scalp coverage and 86% of women saw improved hair growth after only six months. Nutrafol is also trusted and recommended by 3,000 top doctors, more than 3,000 top doctors. You can grow thicker, healthier hair and support our show by going to Nutrafol.com and entering the promo code INSIDE to save $15 off your first month's subscription. This is their best offer anywhere, and it's only available to U.S. customers for a limited time, plus free shipping on every order. Get $15 off at Nutrafol.com, spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com, promo code INSIDE. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Do you ever have days where you feel like an amateur, like you can't get your lines out, you can't, you're, you, you, the nerves start happening, you've done this a million times, but all of a sudden you're like, why am I feeling this? And you feel like you're a, a newbie again and you're, you just want to take off to the moon or something. For some reason, for me, that happens pretty much every time I'm on set. Really? You get- no, no, I'm, I'm being <laughs> hyperbolic. But I, um, I, it does happen when I when I've been off for a while, like when we would come back on Supernatural, when we come back from my hiatus and get back to work, I'd be like, shit, I forgot how to act. What yeah. am I doing? I mean, you know, you jump between you and me, it, yeah. I never really knew how to act, but, <laughs> um, but it was like, oh, this is even worse than usual. So yeah, for sure. That's it. Oh man. Yeah. Ryan, you don't get panic attacks really, do you? No, I never had one. Never. You never you don't want one i don't want one well just know but, that if you're having one it's probably not a heart attack it's probably a panic attack yeah well, well, right unless it's a heart you're attack. gonna you're gonna of course have a heart attack and be like yeah it's, it's, it's just, probably a panic it's attack. just a panic you're attack like, i don't need to go to the doctor what what, what arm is it by the <laughs> burnt way burnt toast is it, is, it, is it your closest to, yeah burnt toast and then you smell no that's a stroke i think oh yeah but isn't it like a your left t- arm tingly, gets numb and your yeah. left arm the one closest to your heart right i don't remember yeah, i don't remember either yep supernatural was in 2021 top streaming programs acquired it was number seven on all the fucking streamers i read that stat criminal minds was number one and i didn't realize anyone was watching that i know it's amazing it's like a show that's two shows that no one (laughs) really thinks about anymore but supernatural is a huge show i mean you you said something one time that it's not a hollywood darling it's kind of under the radar but it feels like every time i go on twitter even now that the show's over supernatural is trending one of you guys is trending right every fucking day what is that about how well we are constantly trying to create controversy in order to stay relevant (laughs) Um, so I'm, we're, we're doing a convention in Texas this weekend and we all plan to be streaking downtown in Dallas, uh, just to get some notoriety on Twitter. You're going to just get naked (laughs) and do it. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think we've, you know, for whatever reason, we lucked into a really ardent fan base that just, uh, you know, being a supernatural fan, I think has become kind of an identity and, um, and how do you feel about that? Well, uh, at times it feels amazing, and at times it's kind of so strangely surreal that it's almost dissociative. Like I, I don't even know how to process it. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's also one of those things that I've been, you know, it's it's been whatever fourteen years now, so I'm a bit Jesus. inured to it. It just feels normal. Right? What do you think it is about the show? Do you think it's just like there's some kind of uh, it's almost like a cult, maybe, or a um. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess there is a reason that they use the phrase cult hit. Yeah, um, you know, in a way, right? With the fans? I think that it's a combination of factors. One of them is that uh, the show was on television for 15 years. And so the audience actually got to watch these two characters, Jared and Jensen, that, that Jared and Jensen were playing, grow up as those actors grew up. Like you see those the first season of that show – and they're kids. Yeah. And, you know, when the show ended, they were washed up. <laughs> and, and and so for an audience member oh. who actually started watching early on, uh, to be able to carry through to the end of the arc of the series, they feel like they've grown up with those characters. They've been in their home for so long that they feel like family. And the show hits on um, themes of family. And I think that that's a big 
a big factor in it. And I think another factor is that our show came of age at the same time that Twitter came of age. Like social media was just a burgeoning. Yeah, we were at, we were done. Right. You, we weren't around you when didn't, social media. So you didn't have that opportunity to right. engage with your fans yeah. the way we did. Correct. And we happened, I think because there wasn't really a terribly solid template for us to follow because it was really nascent at that point. We didn't know what to do. And so we were kind of playful with the audience. And we have always been kind of playful with the fans at the conventions in a way that I think is a little bit unconventional, if yeah. you pardon the use of that term in this context. And um, and I think that that we weren't terribly guarded with the fans. We were a little bit vulnerable. We were a little bit open, a little bit yeah. open hearted. Um, we were willing to, you know. Make an ass of yourself make total asses of ourselves humiliate I do the ourselves same thing yeah with our fans i just yeah i feel like because i think i i was in were you a fanboy at all before you became an actor like i would go to some conventions like horror conventions and like go that dude that's the guy from uh evil dead 2 or that's the dude from dawn of the dead man that's Flyboy. uh you know i'm gonna go get his autograph i i was that guy and then i Fast forward all those years and I'm I'm at the convention signing. So I always loved conventions. Were you like that at all? Were you somebody who wants no, autographs? No, I wasn't a dork. You weren't a, <laughs> I wasn't a dork like me. Did you want autographs? Do you have autographs at your house? Um, I have a, I, I, when I was eight, I wrote a letter to Dr. Seuss and he wrote back to me and I got a signed photo from Dr. Seuss. Um, I, it's funny actually being around these microphones in, in a studio setting reminds me of this, but I was a huge fan of public radio, national public radio. I just nerded out on, I knew the names of all the hosts and all the shows and when the shows were on, on wow. my local station. And I would listen to how old were you when you were doing this? This was like, you know, starting early in high school. Um, when I was, when I turned 18, uh, my girlfriend who later became my wife, uh, got me a surprise birthday present and it was like, she, she was taking me somewhere and I, and we were in Northern Virginia at the time. And she said, uh, I said, well, just tell me where you're taking me. She's like, no, I'm not going to spoil the surprise. And I said, come on, just, just give me the address. And she said, okay, fine. It's 2020 M street Northwest. And I was like, oh shit, that's National Public Radio headquarters. I know that. Like I was such a, I was such a nerd. And so then for my birthday, she took me in to listen to the recording of a, an episode of uh, All Things Considered. All and things, it was like, this is All Things Considered. Is that what they <laughs> that's say? That's very good. Yeah. Um, but I, so then I ended up interning at National Public Radio headquarters and, uh, and then working there briefly uh, when I was quite young. And walking around the halls and, you know, he, seeing the faces that were connected to the voices that I knew so well wow. was so thrilling to me. Um, so that's where I nerded out the most. Someone asked me um, not too long ago, maybe maybe three years ago, um, if, if I could have uh, dinner with anyone living, who would it be? And I said, you know what? I think it would probably be Bob Garfield who's a national public radio personality who wow. he hosts this, uh, this, or he hosted this show, um, called on the media, which I loved. Um, but, uh, this was on stage at a convention. I answered that question. And then two days later I got a phone call and it was Bob Garfield on the phone. What? Like, My Twitter exploded. Who are you? And now we've become friends <laughs> and it's like, it's very exciting. What do you uh, talk about with him? Is there a lot to talk about? We talk about our personal lives. We talk about our, our failings, our shortcomings, uh, our, our, how old is he? He's, I don't know. I don't know how old Bob Garfield is. He's gotta be 65. Bob, how old are you? Bob, are you listening? Bob Garfield? I owe you a call by the way, Bob. I'm, I'm going to call you after this podcast. <laughs> Uh, you talked about this ad nauseum. I mean, on so many interviews, but I, I think it's pretty incredible that, you know, you, you come up for a three guest star spot or whatever, and then all of a sudden you're working 12 years on a show where you, I mean, you must've been really good. You must've just fit right the fuck in for them to make you a regular that quick. I, well, they didn't make me a regular that quick. It, it, it was by degrees. They kept adding three more episodes, three more episodes. And then finally they were like, all right, it looks like we're stuck with you. Um, but I didn't fit in. I don't think, I think it was an interesting, um, mix where I was actually, I was, uh, somehow 
I was a foil uh, to to Sam and Dean's characters, in and I was different enough that it kind of it filled out the cast a little bit in a way um, that if I when I when I first uh, got on set, I hadn't really watched the show. I was like a kind of lazy guest star actor. I was like, I don't know. Nobody watches the like show. Me, that's what I would have done. Who cares? I, yeah, got, I don't know. I'm gonna, I'll be gone. And I'll be gone before anyone yeah. even I, knows that I was here. <laughs> And so uh, I I knew that I was going to be playing an angel. And so I kind of showed up with this very ethereal, other earth, you know, otherworldly quality. And you added the voice. And I had the voice, you know, the deep voice for various reasons, because I thought that was going to be cool. It turned out it was a pain in the ass for, for a long time. But I... Um, I we did the first take and uh, the producer who was also the director, the executive producer, director Kim Manners uh came up to me and he said uh can you try to do that again but not not so spooky and i was just like up i was the wrong tone for the show altogether because all of the characters that played demons or witches or whatever they just came across as real humans in the show at that point right and i was playing something that was like spook spooky and otherworldly because <laughs> i didn't hadn't watched the show um but ultimately as that character got tweaked and honed uh I, I was a fish out of water. I didn't quite fit in, but it was actually in a weird way, kind of what the show needed at that point. Right. Um, and, and I think, you know, obviously it worked to an extent because yeah. they kept me there for, you know, I watched that. outtakes. I just saw these outtakes and it just seems like the whole time Jensen and Jared are fucking with you. That, that is a fair characterization of my experience. I mean, it's show. nonstop. Yeah. It's a, it's abuse is what it it's is. It's abuse because didn't you have a lot? I mean, you, you always had to say a bunch of, you had a lot of lines. I had plenty of lines. Yes. Plenty of and lines. They, and they would uh, incessantly fuck with me. And, and you're trying to remember these lines and they're fucking with or you. Or trying to even just say them. <laughs> um, yes. Um, it was. It was maddening at times, but it was also, um, I think, demonstrative of the fact that we had a lot of fun on set. Like we, I, I, I think it it is probably north of a million dollars in overtime that Warner Brothers had to pay <laughs> for because of you us fucking, fucking around. around on set over the years. Yeah, but without hyperbole, I think that's probably is, true. Is it safe to say, I mean, like, you probably love these guys like brothers. I mean, but you all three are extremely close. Yeah, it is. You know, it's funny. I think that um, one of the one of the interesting things about the Supernatural fandom is that there are all of these factions. Like, there are people who consider themselves Sam fans and Dean fans and Jared fans and Misha fans. And a lot of times they butt heads. There are, you know, small but vocal minorities of these of the fandom that like the Jared fans who hate the Misha fans or hate that I came on the show at all. And, you know, and you have people that hate you. Yes. And and I but I think that there are also small but vocal groups that think that we actors don't get along or that, you know, there's some feud going on between me and Jared or Jared and Jensen or whatever. And. The fact of the matter is we get along great. And when we, you know, hang up or end phone calls with one another, we always say, love you, brother. Can't wait to see you. I mean, we're like, we really love and care for each other. Um, but there's this whole narrative. Maybe it's, maybe it's the, sorry, I keep banging. You're the fine. Maybe it's the fans um, trying to find a way to cultivate some additional drama uh now that but the there really isn't any drama show. to be said no you never had a day where you're like oh my god fuck off oh no no we've all we, <laughs> we all, all of course, like 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 people like life like, real friends like friends and like you know like siblings we have all, all fought with one another at one point or another and had like real knockdown drag out arguments really um you but, raised your voice with each other yes certainly but we also uh, but that's because we have like a really close relationship and the, the overarching tenor of our friendships is one of friendship and love for sure. What's the biggest fight that you could recall on set that you were just like, fuck off. Like the three, you're just not getting along or you're, you're not getting along with someone. Do you remember it? You know, I always remember those moments when I flipped out on Welling, I was uh -huh. directing an episode and he was going. Everything was going wrong. The dolly broke. Allison's clothing had a problem. Uh, th this window wasn't closing. And he goes in there and goes, dude, 
You're behind. What the fuck? And I go, hey, fuck off, Kubrick. I'm doing my best here. We got a lot of problems. He goes, dude, chill. I'm just fucking with you. I'm like, well, fuck. Got a lot <laughs> going on right now. You're trying to earn respect here. <laughs> and people are fucking with you. But there's got to be a day that you can remember that. Or maybe not. No, yeah. I mean, there are times, there were times when, um, there was a time when uh, Jared, I can't remember. Oh, yeah. I mean, we have. <laughs> well, here it comes. Uh, Jared, uh, we were on a flight together and Jared uh, took a photo of me. Like I I failed to lock the door on the bathroom in the in the airplane. And Jared noticed and just opened the door and took a picture of me on the toilet. And Exposed? I was, while I was on the toilet, you know, and I grabbed his phone when I got back on the plane and flushed it down the toilet, <laughs> which precipitated a very unpleasant uh, fight between us. But I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> you actually flushed his toilet down the plane bath. I flushed his phone down the uh, ba- Your phone. Yeah. Down the plane toilet. That was that was that's a big thing to do. I know. It was a dick move. Now, how upset was he? He was furious. Violent? Like he wanted no, to he hit you? He wasn't violent, but he was so pissed at me that he wouldn't talk to me. And and he shouldn't. I was I it was a completely disproportionate response to what he had done. And yet <laughs> <laughs> And yet that was early on in our that was early on on the show when we would get into like pranking each other and escalating things. And sometimes those things got to the point where it was like, this isn't funny anymore. You know, one or the other of us would take it a little bit too far. And that happened mostly with between me and Jared. But Jensen did stuff, too. And I was like, really, dude, really? <laughs> and you're just like, fuck off, guys. I need but, to focus here. Or but whatever I'll tell is. you, as we got older and um, I. And I think a little bit more mature. Um, we stopped doing that. I think that our we're not we're not fucking with each other like that anymore. Right. We're, we're too old for this nonsense. Well, yeah, actually, I think so. You think so? I think you think it just got old after like season seven or eight. Or yeah, yeah. That's when it kind of that is actually I think about when it petered out. Really? Yeah. Do you miss it? No. <laughs> you don't miss it. No. You know, Jared and Jensen got to keep that famous car. What was the car? A Chevelle? What was it? Uh, Impala. Impala. Chevy, Chevy Impala. They both got one. Yep. Did they give you anything or were you allowed to take anything home with you? Did you take anything home with you? I have some I have some artifacts from the show. Uh, I don't have an Impala, but, uh, <laughs> but I right. have some artifacts from the show. Um, yeah. I don't know what I'm going to do with them. I'm not really a collector, so I don't like put things out on display. And what are you saying? Uh, I do like your collection of things. I, 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 I <laughs> as I was looking at the baseballs on on your shelf here. Yeah, I, like, I got baseballs I, and stuff. It's just like you know, I figure I could, I could have my office and a podcast room where I could, you know, these are kind of collectibles and things like that. And the rest of the house is just kind of like nice. I like this. I want you I like wa- this. I, I want to have my house look more like this. You want a studio with what are these? What are these bobblehead things up here? Oh, uh, the little bobbleheads on the shelf? Yeah. Um, those are just like a collection that I have. I mean, you know, free shit or like, uh, you know, Napoleon Dynamite, Hellraiser, Christmas Vacation, uh, you know, all that shit. And then oh, those, Christmas I have vacation, puppets. Yeah. Those puppets, it's a uh, Princess Leia puppet I got in, I don't know, Australia. That right, that head right there is what I wore in an episode of Smallville. It's called Onyx, where I split in half good Lex, bad Lex. Oh, really? And I kept that. It was very uncomfortable. Um, and yeah. Wow. It. You know, I auditioned for that role. Lex you auditioned Luthor. for Lex? Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you beat me out. Oh, my God. Yeah. I don't know how. I, I still, <laughs> it still amazes me that I got that role. It was, it was a lucky day, man. It was one of those days. That's, isn't it? Isn't it interesting how one little thing can change the course of your life so radically? You know, it's just like having that confidence for that one moment in time, and they're like, "That's the guy," and you're like, "What?" I remember my friends going, "Dude, I cannot see you as Lex Luthor. Are you fucking kidding me?" I remember my friend Matt. Uh, when we came out, they had Lex Luthor dolls and we were, I was having a little gathering and everybody's laughing and he turns around and he has the, my doll up his asshole. <laughs> yeah. That, that just kind of put me into my place. You know, that put me, <laughs> that's, that's mad for you. Ballard, you fuck. <laughs> Inside of you is brought to you by magic spoon. Ryan, we love magic spoon. Why do we love magic spoon? 
Uh, because it is something that uh, it rekindles memories of childhood, but it does not uh, hurt your digestion. We'll that is that, that is correct. <laughs> As a child, we have cereals. I won't say the cereals' names, but we we eat them because they're delicious and they taste sweet. And it's just it's just you know that's what we like. But as adults, you're like, oh, this is unhealthy for me. I can't mm-hmm. do this. But with Magic Spoon, you can. You can go back to feeling like a child again. Mm-hmm. You can have these delicious bowls of cereal. Uh, you know, because cereal was one of the best parts of growing up. It really was. Um, I had to give it up because uh, it's obviously the, a lot of them are full of sugar and junk that I really shouldn't be eating. We're all trying to eat better, but healthy breakfast doesn't have to be boring. Magic Spoon has the amazing flavors you love, but without all the bad stuff. And it's amazing as a midnight snack right before bed. You know, we've been trying to cut down on carbs, sugar, and unhealthy food and realize that we basically can't eat anything anymore. Yeah, no, that's true. Uh, I've been drinking protein shakes, Mm -hmm. you know, um, powder for years, but finally found a delicious way to get my protein before and after workouts. And believe it or not, that is Magic Spoon. I've had demonstrations of the flavors here. I've had my friends eat the stuff. It is delicious. You're not, my friends have texted me going, come on, is this Magic Spoon stuff for real? It is for real. I, I love it. Uh, check this out. Uh, zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving, only 140 calories a serving. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and low-carb. You build your own box. Available flavors to build your own custom bundles are cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, blueberry, cinnamon, cookies and cream, and maple waffle. Uh, I don't know about you. I love the cinnamon. I love the peanut butter. Fruity. (laughs) I do love the fruity. Uh, This is easy, guys. You got to check this out. Uh, Go to magicspoon.com slash IOU to grab a custom bundle of cereal. And be sure to use our promo code IOU at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Come on, it's right there, right there in front of you, Magic Spoon. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash IOU and use the code IOU to save $5 off. And thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this podcast. Inside of You is brought to you by Helix Sleep. What do we do most in our lives, Ryan? I would say sleep. I would say sleep is correct. Mm-hmm. We, we do a lot of sleeping. And if you're not sleeping on a good mattress, something that you wake up refreshed, you are sleeping on the wrong freaking mattress. What I love about Helix is they have a quiz. It's easy. I took it. It takes moments out of your life and it gets you connected with the best mattress. That's that's right for you, mm-hmm. ultimately. Mm-hmm. And uh, we'll talk about that in a second. But look, not being able to sleep because of today's politics, pandemics, your love life, any other drama uh, that we can think of, uh, you know, these are these are big issues in our world. And if you're not getting a good night's sleep with all the stress and stuff that's in, uh, around here, I, I don't know what you're doing. Helix Sleep has a quiz that takes just two minutes to complete, matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. Why would you buy a mattress made for someone else? With Helix, you're getting a mattress that you know will be perfect for the way you sleep. Everybody's unique, and Helix knows that. So they have several different mattress models to choose from. They have soft, medium, and and firm mattresses. Mattress is great for cooling you down if you sleep hot, and even the Helix Plus mattress for plus-size sleepers. I took the Helix quiz. I was matched to, of course, the medium mattress because, you know, I wanted something somewhere in the middle, Mm -hmm. obviously, like my porridge. You know what I'm talking (laughs) about? Um, It's a huge upgrade to what I used to have, and, uh, you know, my sleeping has, it's enhanced. It's better, and I, I really thank Helix Sleep for that. It's been awesome getting messages from so many of you telling me how Helix Sleep has changed your life, how much you like the Helix mattress. So thank you for sharing those with me. So if you're looking for a mattress, just take the quiz, order the mattress that you're matched to, and the mattress comes right to your door shipped for free. You don't ever need to go to a mattress store again. How stressful are freaking mattress stores? They're stressful. Yes. Helix is awesome, but don't take my word for it. Helix was awarded the number one best overall mattress pick of 2020 and by GQ and Wired Magazine. 
Just go to helixsleep.com slash inside, take their two minute sleep quiz, and they'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. That's true. And they have a 10 year warranty and you can get, uh, I think you get a hundred nights. Yeah, that's what it is. You get to try it out for a hundred nights risk-free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it, but you will. Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash inside. That's Helix, H-E-L-I-X, sleep.com slash inside for up to $200 off and two free pillows. Inside of You is brought to you by Shopify. I'll tell you, my Inside of You online store has grown exponentially and thanks to Shopify. They make it so easy to have a, like a website of like product that you can sell. That's what I'm calling it. <laughs> Shopify is, I don't think there's anybody else out there. Are there? If there are, I don't know about them. I don't want to know about them. <laughs> Shopify makes it easy. It gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big business so upstarts, startups, and established businesses alike can sell everywhere, synchronize online and in-person sales, and effortlessly stay informed. Scaling your business is a journey of endless possibility. I also love that you can connect with your customers. Yeah, you know, figure out how to drive sales, manage your day-to-day. -day. It's all right there. It's all so easy to use. If you haven't used Shopify and you're thinking about selling something or, you know, having a, a website full of items that you think will sell, this is the, this is the place to go. Shopify, to me, is the only place that is, is going to make it easier for you. And uh, you're going to know what you're selling, what, what sells, what doesn't. And, uh, you know, thank you, Shopify. Believe me, this podcast started out selling very few things. I had very few products. I didn't know what I was doing. And when I realized how easy it was, today we're doing really well. People, it's easy to get to the store, uh, to the Shopify account and, and order your favorite things. And uh, I don't know what I would do without them. Uh, success is a million milestones on a forever evolving path. Like my Shopify account, Shopify powers millions of businesses from first sale to full scale. Reach customers online and across social networks with an ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and more. Gain insights as you grow with detailed reporting of conversion rates, profit margins, and beyond. I love putting in, well, how much did I make from March 1st till April 10th? Whatever it is. And they go, oh, you made this much money. This is what your, your best-selling product was. So you could see what works, what doesn't work. It's all right there, right there in your Shopify account. Uh, I love it. I love Shopify. It's more than a store. Shopify grows with you. This is possibility powered by Shopify. Go to shopify.com slash inside, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash inside right now. Shopify.com slash inside. Hey, how was it working with uh, Larry King or being on Larry King's show? That had to be fun because I watched that interview. Um that that was an I think I that was one of those pinch me moments where I just couldn't believe I was sitting down and talking to Larry King. You know, he's a he was uh, such an icon yeah. and for a good reason. He was so easy to talk to. Yeah. He said that you, Misha, had the most questions ever asked on his show ever. For a guest. Which is probably, I mean, he's had a lot of huge A-listers, like, you know, and he says that you had the most questions. Are you blown away by that? Yeah, I was blown away by that. Again, that was early in the days of social media, right? I think that was, you know, probably a decade ago. Yeah, and, something like that. Um, and you know, the Supernatural fans had already figured it out and were already, you know, online and active and, you know, the likes of... Oprah Winfrey hadn't yet, you know, <laughs> developed a, an online uh, right. social media following. So, yeah, it's strange. Do you still get tons of gifts from fans or have you said, hey, guys, please don't give me any gifts. Spend that money and donate to like my charity or something like that. Do you ever? Oh, God, I would never say something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I would Just... never say something so selfless as that. <laughs> Uh, it's fun. It's funny. I went, uh, I did a convention in Japan and, uh, have you ever been to, no, Japan? I don't, I don't know if Smallville would be big there. It, I, it was such a funny experience because it was like, uh, everyone who came up to the, to the autograph table brought a gift. Right. And 
Um, and I, and I guess it was just, it's just a cultural thing. Like you're visiting our co country, here's a gift. And I, I kept on just grabbing the thing and setting it down next to me. And, uh, and then some, one of the, uh, uh, assistants at the convention said, where would you like the stuff, all the gifts? And I said, oh, I don't know, just uh, bring it up to my hotel room. And I got to my hotel room and I couldn't open the door to my hotel room. There was, l l it, they had literally <laughs> filled up the entire what? room with gifts. And it was, it was quite fun going through it all. I had my kids. You with went through it. it all. I went through it all and I had my kids with me and it was Christmas time. Like it was right before Christmas. So I was like, kids, this is Christmas. So we went through this mountain of gifts from these some really great Japanese gifts. Fans. Some really great, like there were some GoPros and things like that in there. What? But, Never been a GoPro. But the amazing thing was then the next year at Christmas, the, my kids were young at the point that point. They were like, Dad, can't wait for Christmas and all the gifts. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. That's not how it's going to be. <laughs> that was just a one-off, kids. So now they're forever disappointed with the holidays. Wow. And so you don't just say, you know, hey, I thank you for all the gifts, but you really don't. Because you probably get gifts every convention you go to. You'll go to Texas and you'll get tons of shit, right? Um, yeah, although, uh, I think over, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, yeah, I, the, the conventions now do tell people not to give gifts. So yeah. we, we don't get, we don't get that. I got that much, you stuff. know, this, my friend Lee and Kristen made me a, a pillow with every guest I've had on the podcast. Oh, well, and that's then, very sweet. Right. Isn't that nice? I, I use yeah. it. And then they gave me another one. So because you have pillows. <laughs> two pillows filled you're with gonna, all my, you're, yeah. soon you will need another pillow. Yeah. I think yeah, I've had, I, I just, I think I just had my 200th. Oh my God. It's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot of people. Like, I never thought I would be doing this either. I just was like, I, I, I can't do this. I'm not. No, who wants to listen to me? And most people don't. But um, are you are you talking? Who are you to talking to primarily? I, I, I don't listen to your show on the regular. I just listen to, to when I'm on it. Um, who do I what? Uh, who, who do you interview? Is it is it other actors? Uh, you mostly, know, anywhere or? from like Bob Odenkirk to to Kiefer Sutherland to. Uh, Jennifer yeah. Love Hewitt, Jensen so, was just but, on. But it's mostly actors. Mostly actors, actors directors, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, occasionally, I'll have an athlete on or a rocker. You know, I had Richard Marks on, who's a friend. And uh -huh. like, you know, so it's fun. It's fun to kind of, you know, talk to these to these folks and get to know them. But, you know, I, as much as like, you know, in passing, we'll be like, hey, Misha. Yeah, I kind of know Misha through, right. you know, and we've seen each other. But to me, this is pretty cool because you throw on some headphones and for an hour, I learn a lot about you. You know, I get to know you a little bit more and like, you know, it's, it's, it's not an opportunity for me to really listen. Cause I'm a, I, it's hard for me to listen. Mm -hmm. I, if you take these headphones off and we're out there, I mean, I'll listen to you, but I'll, I'll sometimes I'm, I'm a scatterbrain, little ADD, but this forces you to kind of just like, yeah, zone in. I just did this, um, uh, series for PBS called road food. Yeah. And we Jensen said to ask you about that. We traveled around the country, um, talking to. I mean, honestly, we were using food as a as a window into worlds. So we're looking at little, you know, regional dishes, uh, you know, gumbo in Louisiana, for example. And we're using that as a as a window into worlds where we'll, I'll sit down and literally break bread with people and talk to them about their lives and world. But it was actually really fascinating because it was an excuse, like you're saying, an excuse to sit down and listen to people and talk to people and get to know them that I wouldn't otherwise have sat down with. There just wouldn't have been occasion, but I also wouldn't have, I just wouldn't have made the space and time for it. Yeah. And so when you slow down and you give some time and That's attention it. and you actually let yourself be present with someone, it's kind of remarkable. Like I glean these little pearls of life wisdom from the guy who ran the little tortilla factory sure. in Brownsville, Texas. Um, or you know, or, or or the mayor of Tangier Island in in the Chesapeake Bay. All of these individuals that I would never have talked to um, were willing to just open up, and it was lovely. It was yeah. really fascinating. I actually I, feel like I learned about the human family through that experience. That's amazing, and I feel I feel the same way. I think you nailed it. I think you know, sitting with someone, there's like little morsels, little things that you've said little things that other guests have said, which sort of helped me or they help other people who are listening. It's just like a candid conversation open and I kind of just, th you know, throw shit at you. And I, I find it to be fun. I, I, I was going to quit many times 
the first 10 interviews, I was like, nobody's listening. Nobody's listening. 15, ugh, it's 20. you know, 30 guests in. I'm just like, what am I doing? Man, no one wants to hear me interview people. And then all of a sudden, I stuck with it. And I started to get more vulnerable. And I think that's when the show got better. When I started to open up and I started to start talk about my imperfections, which are I have many. <laughs> and I think that's, you know, people kind of like that I open up like that. And, you know, even you, you open up again about your divorce and all the shit you're going through. And it's like, wow, it's, uh, you know, it's not all about fluff and all about what you're doing next. And, you know, it's, uh, I don't know. I find it interesting to see that, you know, we all go through ruts. We all go through tough times, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I, um, that kind of reminds me of when I, when I first got on Supernatural and for, you know, the CW was, knocking and saying we need you to come do some interviews and i my at that at that time my wife was in graduate school she was getting her phd in pop culture history and her advisor uh, had just written a biography of marilyn monroe and Mar marilyn monroe had been one of these early starlets who had totally cultivated her public persona so everything about her was cultivated her, the color of her hair, the shape of her nose, the timber of her voice, everything was cultivated and based on what the the, the A-listers of the time were looking like and sounding like and how they were walking and talking. So Jesus. I thought, well, maybe this is my opportunity to <laughs> cultivate my public persona. This is the first time I'm getting in, you know, doing interviews. It's the first time I'm getting in front of cameras and talking about myself, Misha in quotes. Right. I, I can present however I want. I can present as the ideal version of American masculinity. And we started, I started doing interviews and had this idea of, of a version of myself that I wanted to, to have the public see. And it was stiff and awkward and uncomfortable and not at all charming. And I suddenly realized I can't do this. Like I, if I do this, I'm going to quit this job altogether. Right. I, I hate You're not this. being authentic. And so I just started bearing it all. And I was like, oh, okay, that's, 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 me. that's how it's going to have to be for me. Well, it's worked. Um, it's worked for you. Yeah, I suppose. I suppose it's yeah. worked. You know, you said that you you don't really feel like you fit in. You said that before. Because mm -hmm. I always feel like that, too. I always feel like when I'm around other celebrities or at a party, I'm just like, I just don't feel like I fit in. And I could pretend to fit in. Is that what you're saying in a way? Or do you just not like to be around big celebrity parties? And, and not that I go to a party, especially now in the last two years. But what is it? What do you mean exactly when you say you don't feel like you fit in? Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure what what context that statement was made in, but I know that I felt that way when I was growing up. Um, I was, you know, my my family was homeless at times and we were moving constantly when I was a kid. I lived in 15 different places by the time I was in uh, high school and Jesus. Uh, was in a new school every year. And that, uh, that all of those factors combined to make me always an outsider in school. And I didn't have a friend group. And so I was always, I was, I really actually didn't fit in. And I was also not terribly well socialized. We didn't have a television. My mom kind of dressed me as a girl. So I would, you know, show I remember up. you talking about that in the last podcast. Okay, yeah. Right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm rehashing. I like no, to rehash. The I like it. Material. No, I like that. But, but long story short. I just I I always kind of felt like an outsider and I and I felt like I had to figure out some tricks to ingratiate myself to social groups. So I I relied on self-deprecating humor. That was something that I used a lot of in high school. And I found that I people were like, "Oh, that's kind of charming." They'd laugh at it. And at some point I realized I have to stop doing all of this self-deprecating humor cuz I'm putting myself down so much that I'm starting to feel bad about myself. Wow. Um but when I, 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 and it still shows up in some places. I sure. know I've done a lot of therapy and Me work too. on like early childhood trauma and realized that, you know, I actually was traumatized in a locker room when I was really young. So when I go into locker rooms, even now as an adult, I feel uncomfortable. And that played out in, in high school and college. Like I didn't really want to be involved in organized sports because I didn't want to be in locker rooms and I didn't even realize that was happening, you know, 
but I was like, this, this isn't, I don't fit in here. Right. So as I get older, I'm starting to find that I'm a little bit more comfortable in my own skin. Like I feel like I fit in <laughs> inside me if, you know, to, to yeah. uh, plagiarize your podcast uh, title. <laughs> inside but, you. Um, but I, but I, you know, as I'm getting more comfortable in my skin, I think I'm a little bit less concerned with whether or not I quote fit in or not and i'm and i'm more okay being whatever kind of peripheral outsider i am and and as a consequence i do feel more comfortable in you know most social situations now i'm not as like i'm not watching myself to to figure out whether or not people are okay with how i'm behaving yeah am i cool much? enough am i i don't am really I fitting it you don't really give I a don't shit really care it's taken anymore. it's taken years though to probably get there yeah it right has. yeah I used to I used to run things over in my head a lot like oh did what did they think of me you know did did I embarrass myself right and now I can do something embarrassing and be like well that was stupid <laughs> and then move on and move on uh Jared Padalecki was texting me this morning <sighs> what an asshole he said he said uh see if he's willing to tell you about the fart on the plane story <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, yeah, sure. Let's do it. Let's, let's do my fart story. What is it? So um, I, I don't know how long your your podcast can run, but this is a long. Is long it? Well, can we, can we? Nope. It has to be incredibly long. So oh um, all right. I I was uh I was flying um from Los Angeles to Boston on JetBlue and stopped off before the flight to have dinner with uh, my wife's mother. And uh, my wife and I were vegetarians at the time. And she took us to P.F. Chang's China Bistro. And we had no money at this point. And so we gorged on every vegetarian entree they had at P.F. Chang's. And there was a lot of roasted garlic and everything, it seemed like. And that's something that doesn't necessarily agree with my system. We got on the flight and I was it was a packed flight. And I was sitting in a middle seat. And about half hour into the flight, I felt like the pressure building up. I was oh, like, I gotta, I've got to let, I've got to, I've got to fart. But I didn't want to, like, excuse me, sorry, get up, get up, and go to the bathroom. I was just gonna let it. I, so I decided what just, I would do is just let it out a little bit at a time, uh, so that it would dissipate and not be a big deal. And you know, and, on the plane when you fart, it's like no one can hear it. Nobody can hear because <laughs> there's the, the sound of the jet engine. It's gonna be fine. Yeah. So anyway, I, I. I endeavored to let it out a little bit at once, but unfortunately, I don't know, pressure change or something, it, it all came out at once. And just the fart, just just the fart came out. And uh, and there was a guy sitting behind me um, who fainted. From and, your fart? Yeah, and his, uh, his girlfriend called the flight attendants over and said, uh, my, you know, he's, he's, they, they came, they administered oxygen, they, they resuscitated him. And she said, somebody, somebody has gas. And the flight attendant said, no, no, ma'am, that's not possible. Uh, all of the, all of the fuel is stored on the wings. There's nothing, none of the, none of fuel, the fuel could come into the no. fuselage at all. It's not possible. And so they all let it go. I, I fell asleep. I, I woke up uh it was about an hour later and i had to fart again and i thought oh, i'll just just a little bit at a time again i farted again the guy faints again they administer what? oxygen and again his girlfriend says somebody has gas and the flight attendant again ma'am that's not possible it's all <laughs> you're not hearing a, all this 100 percent. i'm hearing it all i'm like slinking down into the seat absolutely mortified <laughs> And the woman sitting next to them in that in the row said, so they say, no, ma'am, it's not possible for there to be a gas leak. And the woman says, no, -uh, it's not a gas leak. Somebody has to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and so we land the plane and everyone has to sit in their seats while paramedics come and get this guy oh, off the you're plane. You're going to shit your pants. As he's saying, as he's saying, I, it's never happened to me before. I, I, I don't know. It's just something smells so bad. <laughs> oh, my God. Anyway. That is superb. So I don't know what your sponsorship relationship is with I love P.F. That. Chang's China oh Bistro. My God. But if P.F. Chang's isn't paying you, they should be. All right. That was a, an unbelievable story because you know, you know how much I love farts, Ryan. <laughs> uh, and then lastly, he said the story of kayaking in Palau. Oh, huh. 
I don't really know if there's much of a story All right, well, you know. That. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right, this is la- the last thing is shit talking with uh, Misha Collins. This is my these are my patrons. They give back to the show. They get to ask questions. It's rapid fire, okay. if you will. And that's it. Lisa H. Is it just a little, little bit out? Is what he's saying. What? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. Just, just a little just, bit. Just a little bit. That's amazing. That's amazing that someone fainted from your ass. Yeah. It's a it's sad but true. Ah, it's like a Metallica song. Lisa H. During the filming of Supernatural, when Cass and Dean were watching porn, what was really on the screen? Porn, something else, or nothing? My husband wants to know because your expressions were priceless. In that particular instance, there was it was just lights on the screen um, that that were flickering uh, and very carefully cultivated to make it look like I was watching television. Um, however, I will tell you that um, in the show. There is a, a recurring motif uh, that uh, that Dean likes t- this magazine called Busty Asian Beauties. So he's always picking up a copy a copy of Busty Asian Beauties. And I went. There was a an episode where my character was in a convenience store shopping, and there they had on the of course on the magazine rack were copies of Busty Asian Beauty Beauties. And I picked one up and it's, you know, it's a porn magazine. And I picked it up and I opened it expecting to find it, you know, it to be a, 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 uh, an entertainment weekly magazine or something. And I opened it up and sure enough, it was a, <laughs> it was a magazine called Barely 18. And it's an actual porn magazine that the that the set dressers had thought, you know what will be funny? We'll. We'll put this fake cover on an actual. <laughs> oh my god! So I picked it up and I was like, "Oh my god! What am I looking at?" <laughs> so, um, so sometimes there was porn on the set of Supernatural, but it was mostly just the set dressers. <laughs> oh, uh, I love us. that. That's good. They probably got in trouble for that, didn't they? Uh, they will now. They will now. Yeah. Years later, Leanne, what is something people would be surprised to learn about you? Besides that, you're a poet. You have a book published. New York Times best list. Is that correct? Yeah. I got Fuck, it. dude. Yep. Yep. I got New York Times best selling poetry book, which is, I think, not, not a lot of people can say that because not a lot of books of poetry sell. Um, I was pretty excited about that. Um, I am, I would say that I, I consider myself an introvert. I don't think a lot of people know that or would say that about me. I could see that. Um, but I'm fairly introverted. Hmm. Are yeah. you sort of quiet at home? Are you sort of like in your own head? You kind of, you know. No. You're not very animated. No, that, that I can be animated and boisterous, but I also have a tendency to want to recharge on my own. So, you know, I right. don't spend a lot of time hanging out in the green room. Right. Uh, you I, don't care I, about other actors and talking to them. <laughs> Precisely. Yes, <laughs> I know. Nancy D. Well, now that you're a New York Times bestselling poet, can we expect a follow up collection? I don't know, but that is a um, uh, it's something that I'm percolating on to to recycle a word from earlier in the podcast. Yeah, percolate's a good word. Um, I, uh, I I wrote my book of poetry over the course of like 20 years, and um, and definitely was not thinking of a follow up volume. Uh, but it has been well received and I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm starting to write again. So we'll see. I like it. Robin asks, how much weight did you gain during the taping of road food? I am, am sh- shocked to announce <clears throat> that I just went to the doctors and I had high cholesterol and now I have moderately high cholesterol, which is slightly less cholesterol. <laughs> <laughs> moderately and, and and road food was a lot of greasy and fried food so i don't know what happened but somehow somehow i got healthier over the course of it I, oh I you know. got healthy healthier over the course of it yeah i don't know what happened i can't explain it that's amazing what yeah. was the best thing you ate on the road i'm curious um i i liked the viet cajun crawfish it was pretty delicious yeah. I'm allergic to that. Are you? I think I'm allergic <laughs> to shrimp, so probably yeah, not. Yeah, you're not going to be I shouldn't have that. crawfish. For sure not. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. hmm. I miss it. What makes it be a, well, what was it? It was like, it was a combination of spices. It was like Cajun, mm-hmm. Cajun crawfish, but then they infused it with some Vietnamese spices and sauces that were- a secret, I'm hungry now. A secret. So they Sounds wouldn't, they wouldn't tell me hungry. what it was. 
<laughs> uh, Yavor, what is the most memorable memorable day of your life? That's a, that's a tough one. The most memorable day of your life. Why don't we say besides your children being born? I uh, there there certainly I don't know even know how to quantify most memorable. Um, I. I don't have a certain day that I rehash in my mind more than others. I'm not someone who d- spends a lot of time reflecting on the past. Um, I, I have, for some reason, I'm just going to randomly select a memory that's popping out for me. I remember when I was um, four years old, I was sitting on this uh, horse fence and a tractor came down the road in front of the fence. And I remember thinking, well, uh, that's it. I've seen a tractor so many times now that this is no longer interesting. Three years old was the best age. Uh, from now on, it's all downhill. And I, <laughs> I, I, ver- I have this very distinct recollection of that framing of new experiences when I was four years old. So that is memorable. Wow. Yep. That was, my, I, it was the moment that I realized that I had peaked. You peaked at four. (laughs) Laura W., if you hadn't gone down the path of acting, what do you think you would have ended up doing? I'm going to guess politics. You know, it's interesting. I thought I was going to go into politics, and then I course corrected somewhere along the lines. And I actually think I would have been an artist of some sort. I'm not sure if if I would have been a visual artist or a performance artist or – I mean, I, I, I've been working on some large scale public art installations and that has been really gratifying, but also, you know, writing poetry or writing in general, I feel like I need to be expressing some sort of creative energy or else I'm not, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. So something creative. I could see that. Abel F. What dish has taken you to a euphoric place? Versus a dish so bad you couldn't swallow and had to tell the cook no. Um, there, I, I, I have a very fond childhood um, af- affinity for Japanese uh, dumplings um, that my friend used to make, and so it's like that's that's kind of a comfort food for me. Um, I was in Iceland and I tried the fermented shark. Have you, have you sampled this delicacy? No. no. Um, So they take a shark and they bury it in the sand and then the uh, shark starts to decompose and eventually the bladder that's filled with shark urine breaks and the urine helps preserve the remaining rotting flesh. So it's fermented urine soaked shark meat and it tastes even worse than it sounds it was like putrid uh, it was putrid and unfathomable that someone would eat this were they insulted when you no i wasn't like that i think that not many outsiders are able to eat this food wow did you want to throw up yes i did and i i'm still i'm not this is not an exaggeration i'm still getting like goosebumps thinking about that that flavor it was really shudder worthy wow what's what do you love the most in terms of food like what's something that you just you just can feel it coming down your throat (laughs) just you know what i mean like say that again no i don't want to i don't want to but uh, something that you're just like oh i just want like right now i mean i love bolognese Mm. i love that with some garlic bread but yeah what about you i uh I love I love fresh produce. It's funny having to, I'm not having just done this show Road Food, which is like it's we're d- delving into um, regional American cuisine, but it's not like fancy stuff. It's all, it's the stuff that you find at roadside diners, right? And it's very heavy, and it's very salty, and it's very greasy, and it's very bacon laden. And uh, having finished that show, I'm like, I want I want a fresh tomato with maybe a salt shaker and that's it you know um yeah are you are you one to drink sodas and are you pretty healthy i'm pretty healthy salads you look a lot of salad right because i just started that for the new year more salads no sodas no cookies no chips at night less popcorn 
try and eat healthy. I, I'm glad that you haven't cut the popcorn out altogether. Though. Yeah, I've had like, popcorn <laughs> twice this year. Oh. And uh, but you know, you got to have some vice. I've quit a lot of vices. I stopped this vaping bullshit. Oh, you were vaping? I was vaping a lot, occasional smoking. And I'm like, what are you doing? My grandfather, way back when he used to smoke, Irv used to smoke. And my uncle Dave was sitting him in the car, <clears throat> sitting with him in the car. And Back then, you just smoked in the car with the kids. You don't, you don't give a shit. My my grandfather was smoking, and my uncle Dave looks at him. That's his dad, and goes, "Why do you smoke?" And he looked at Dave and goes, "I don't know." And he quit that day. He had no reason. He had no answer for him. He goes, "I huh, I, I don't. That's amazing. I don't know." And he just quit. And I always found that to be pretty cool because really, that's what I think of. I'm like. Why are you doing this? Well, I'm a little stressed. I'm a little, stop it. This isn't helping you. You know, so I'm trying to do that more. And it's, it's not always easy. No. As, you know, the addictive uh, part of our brains will, will give you that little kick. Like right now it would be, right now it would be nice. It would. And it would be nice <laughs> right now. But if you can keep the perspective to remember that in the long run, it's going to kill me in the long run. Yeah. It's not good. If I do it right now, I'm going to want to do it again five hours from now. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's something I think probably all of us struggle with in some. Yeah. We all have vices. Another. We all have that one thing that we're like, fuck. Yeah. I'm not a drinker. I'm not really a smoker. I've been getting into these pot taffies. They're just like low milligram taffies with a little pot that I'll take at night. And I've been taking those a little bit. But now I'm like, wait a minute. Are you taking these every night now? What the fuck, dude? <laughs> this is your next vice. All right. So you said you're working on you right now. You're taking some time off. You're just you're not in the middle of working on something right now. Right now, it's taking care of Misha time. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that sounds good. Yeah. You can continue that for a little while until you're ready for the next step. Yeah. I think you can do there's that. A, well, it's uh, CW money in your bank. There's a, a poet, Rain, Rainier Maria Rilke, from uh, he's a 19th century German poet. And he there's a quote of his that I really love, which is, everything is gestation and birth. And I think that that's really true for creative people, but we have to give ourselves time to gestate. Just give ourselves that space to allow the thing to, to grow. To percolate up. To percolate. The word <laughs> of the uh, podcast. Uh, I really thank you for coming over. This has been a, a real treat for me. And, uh, you know, I we we have I haven't seen you in person in I don't know how long. Yeah, it's been five years. It's I been a long time. Like yeah. And uh, I always learn something. You're, you're a smart guy. You're open. You're, uh, you're, you're one of the good ones. Well, thanks for having me back. It's really nice to see your space in person. <laughs> it's good to be here. And... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Ryan, you want to say anything to uh, Mish? Oh, real quick. Bob Bar Garfield, 67. He's 67. 67. He's 67. I, I, did I say 65? You did say 65. Yeah. God, no. that was pretty close. I had to yeah. Google it. But, you know, he looks much younger than 67. Oh, so, also, what, uh, did Dr. Seuss write you a poem? No, he didn't. Damn. Yeah, I wish. That would have been cool. I also huh? wish I still had the signed photo when I lost it somewhere. Damn. Along the line. Yeah. Damn it. All right. Oh, well. <sighs> All right. Take care. I love you. Bye. You know what was great? It was him talking about these stories, you know, the farting on the plane. One of my favorites. Oh, that was a good story. You know, any any time we talk about farts in a plane. You love a good fart. I'd rather farts in a plane than snakes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, if you're going to ask me. I mean, I think an ultimate nightmare would be farting snakes. Ooh, brutal, Farting snakes on a brutal, plane. Brutal, brutal. Oh. With their uh, diets? <laughs> Thank you, Misha, for being on the podcast again. I appreciate it. Again, if you like Misha and you like the podcast and you're like, hey, I like the interview, listen to the podcast next week. You might learn something. The guests are always forthcoming and, and open and honest. And I feel like people learn things. So I, I appreciate everybody who listens to the podcast every week. And those that don't, if you're here for Misha again, hopefully you'll stick around next week. Um, also, join Patreon if you want to support the podcast. Keep it going without the patrons. I don't think I could do this podcast patreon.com slash inside of you i'll write a message right after also the inside of you online store uh great merch tons of smallville stuff tons of uh, inside of you merch and uh, if you want to go to sunspin.com my band is sunspin you can book me for a zoom uh you could buy sunspin sweet swag sweet swag mm -hmm. hats mm -hmm. shirts whatnot uh 
And uh, what else? You could also, oh, make sure you follow us on all the handles. And what are those handles again, Ryan? At Inside of You Pod on Twitter, at Inside of You Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. That is absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. And please leave a review. You don't know how much it helps to leave a review. Spotify, Apple, YouTube, subscribe everywhere, support the pod. That's all I'm going to say. I appreciate everybody today. And my top tier uh, patrons, um, you know, these these are the folks that I'm about to read their name. This is one of the perks where I read off their name at the end of every podcast. And they really help the podcast in so many ways. They give back. So thank you to all these people. Here we go. Nancy D, Aaliyah S, Sarah V, Little Lisa, Yukiko, Jill E, Brian H, Nico P, Robert B, Jason W, Kristen K, Amelia O, Allison L, Raj C, Joshua D, CJP, Jennifer N, Stacy L, Jen S, Jamal F, Janelle B, Kimberly E, Mike E, L, Don Supremo, 99 more, Ramira, San Diego M, Chad W, Leanne P, Janine R, Maya P, Maddie S, Belinda N, correct, Chris H, Dave H, Spider Man, Chase, Sheila G, Brad D, Ray H, Tabitha T, Tom N, Liliana A, Talia M, Betsy D, Chad L, Rochelle, Marion Meg K, Trav L, Dan N, Big Stevie, W, Angel M, Rhiannon C, Corey K, Super Sam, Dev Nexon, Michelle A, Jeremy C, Andy T, Cody R, Gavinator, <laughs> David C, John B, Brandy D, Yavor, Camille. Camille. Don't know, don't know that I one. Don't know that Take one. a guess. Camille. Take a guess. S. Correct. <laughs> the... C. Correct. Joey M. Willie F. Adelaide N. Omar I. Lena N. Design OTG. Design OTG. Eugene and Leah. Chris P. Corey. Patricia. Heather L. Jake B. James B. Bob. Ed A. Ed A. Abol F. Joshua B. Tony G. Sean R. Megan T. Mel S. Orlando C. John B. Caroline R. Darren B. Rob E. Paul C. Christine H. Christine S, mm. Christine S, Sarah S, and Eric H. Without these folks, I don't know what the podcast would do. We'd suffer. We uh, love all your help, all your um, positivity, and your support. So patreon.com slash inside of you. Thank you, everyone. A lot of great stuff going on, stuff that I can't really talk about just yet, but soon we're working on a new project, and you guys will hear about it probably in the next month, I'd say. Probably in the next month. And uh, Ryan's working on it with us. And um, it's exciting. It's exciting. It's uh, it's new. It's going to be a work in progress. So, you know, hopefully uh, hopefully you're going to dig things. That's all I could say, really. Uh, you have anything else, Ryan? Uh, no. That's a good um, good teaser. That's a good teaser, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It sure is. Uh, I'm headed to Arkansas. Actually, when you hear this, I'll already be back from Arkansas. Mm. But my next cons are going to be uh, St. Louis, Liverpool, Australia, um, uh, Illinois at the Metropolis Festival or something, the uh, mm -hmm. Metropolis, Illinois. Tom and I are going to do uh, Smallville Nights. We're going to do Smallville Nights, I believe, in St. Louis. Um, I believe in, I don't know if in Liverpool we're going to do it, but we're going to do it in Australia. So a lot of great stuff coming up. Hopefully you guys would join me, come to the uh, come to the cons, see us, hug it out. And uh, that's all I really have to say. And uh, also follow me at the Michael Rosenbaum. And I'm on the cameo too. If you want to, if you want to cameo me, he can wish you a happy birthday. Yeah, my birthday's coming up. Oh, so you could wish people a happy birthday. Oh, I can wish. Oh, yeah, that's also right. That. That's right. There's, there's several months before that birthday. That's <laughs> true. I, I have time. I have Jeez. time. That's a big one, though, guys. I'm going to be 50. I can't even believe it. I don't believe it either. I don't. I can't believe it. Anyway, thank you for listening to the podcast. Thanks for being here. Thanks to Ryan mm -hmm. from uh, Michael Rosenbaum here in the Hollywood Hills of California. I'm Ryan Tejas. And uh, I'll give the camera a little wave. Thanks for <laughs> supporting this podcast. Thank you. And uh, have a good week. Be good to yourselves. That's the most important thing, I think, is just be good to yourself. We all, uh, we're all assholes, right? We're all assholes just uh, trying to get by. That's right. So do <laughs> your best. Put that on a bumper sticker. We're all assholes. Just trying you to know? get by. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you, we're all assholes <laughs> just trying to get by. It's it's kind of true. I mean, it's, you know, it's like every day is a, do you think every day is a grind, Ryan? Yeah. Yeah. It shouldn't be, though, right? It shouldn't be, but it has been. It has been. Maybe it's the whole COVID thing for the couple of years, and now we're getting out of it. And 
you know, but like, I just need, I need to get out of my house more. I need to, I'm starting to do that. I'm playing a little tennis. I'm starting to play a little hockey again. I'm, I'm trying to golf a little bit. I'm trying to get out of the house, trying to enjoy my friends and, uh, just, uh, stay positive and not get so absorbed in my shit. Just trying to get by with your asshole. We're all assholes. Just trying to get by. Uh, all my love to you. We'll talk to you next week.